वेलकम टुडे वी शेल डिस्कस पल्सास विच हैज कम टू बी नोन एज रिसाइकल पल्सास ऑल दो द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ रिसाइकल पल्सास इज नियरली फोर्टी ईयर्स ओल्ड दे आर द सब्जेक्ट ऑफ इंटेंस स्टडी टूडे फॉर सेवरल रीजन्स फर्स्ट द कमिंग ऑफ एज ऑफ क्या रे एस्ट्रोनॉमी सेकेंड the recent detection of gravitational waves from merging neutron stars and third the imminent prospect of detecting gravitational waves from millisecond pulsars our story begins in 1974 with the discovery of the first binary pulsar at that time roughly 150 pulsars had already been discovered <clears throat> and they were all solitary pulsars this was the first pulsar in a binary system and both the stars were neutron stars in addition to being the first binary pulsar out of 150 or so it was also a very odd pulsar as we shall see this pulsar has led to many exciting results and in recognition of that joe taylor and his student hulls were awarded the nobel prize for physics in 1993 roughly 20 years after the discovery of this pulsar so the system we are talking about consists of two neutron stars how do we know the other one is also a neutron star that's a different story it will become clear in a few minutes the point to appreciate is that one of the neutron stars is suddenly functioning as a radio pulsar and the beam the radio beam is pointing towards us the other neutron star <clears throat> is not to be seen at least not by us so we can presume that that too must be functioning as a pulsar but its beam is pointing somewhere else therefore some other astronomer in some other part of the galaxy will detect this pulsar <clears throat> but he or she will not be able to see the hull staler binary pulsar that we do detect so that's the system we are talking about now the first thing to appreciate is that this was a very odd pulsar for two reasons what is plotted here on the y axis is the logarithm of the magnetic field and on the x axis is the logarithm of the rotation period of the pulsars so in this island you see there are roughly 150 pulsars in 1974 the fastest pulsar known was of course the crab pulsar born in the year 1054 ad <clears throat> you notice that typically and i showed pictures of this in an earlier lecture the magnetic fields of now 2000 pulsars have been measured and they are between 10 to the power 12 to 10 to the power 14 gauss the hull staler binary pulsar had an extremely small magnetic field and it was also spinning rather fast and there it is the red dot is the binary pulsar the hull staler binary pulsar its very rapid spin rate of 59 millisecond a period of 59 millisecond suggests that it must be a very young pulsar the crab pulsar which is just a thousand years old is spinning at 33 milliseconds so it is reasonable <clears throat> to assume that a pulsar spinning with a period of 59 milliseconds the second fastest pulsar of the time must be relatively young a few thousand years old and yet its magnetic field was a mere 3 times 10 to the power 10 gauss and this suggested that it might be a very old pulsar there were reasons to think that the magnetic fields of pulsars will decay over millions and millions of years therefore if you have a pulsar whose magnetic field is two or three orders of magnitude smaller than the typical magnitude of the pulsar magnetic field then it is reasonable to assume 
that this might be a very old pulsar. So that's what I meant by saying it's a very odd pulsar. On the one hand, it seems to be very, very young. On the other hand, it seems to be very, very old. Or is it just a coincidence? An odd pulsar born with a very low magnetic field. Why shouldn't a pulsar be born with a very low magnetic field? It's possible an odd pulsar will have a very low magnetic field. But then there was another coincidence, a second coincidence. This was the only pulsar <clears throat> out of about 150 which was in a binary system. Now, now you have two coincidences and that would make Miss Marple very unhappy. Those of you who read Agatha Christie's marvelous detective stories will remember Miss Marple, the old lady in a village, very clever and a very good detective. And to quote her from one of the novels, any evidence, said Miss Marple to herself, is always worth noticing. You can throw it away later if it is only a coincidence. So her point would be that I don't think it's a coincidence that this odd pulsar is in a binary system. Now, a very quick recap of the story of pulsars, the evolution of pulsars. This plot, which is the plot of the logarithm of the magnetic field as a function of the logarithm of the rotation period, is the analog of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram in stellar evolution that we discussed at length. So what is plotted here are roughly 2,000 pulsars that are known till today. And if you remember, I said pulsars are born with high magnetic fields and very short periods, roughly over there. And then their periods lengthen. dp, dt is significantly different from zero. And the reason for that is that the energy and angular momentum the pulsar radiate comes at the expense of the stored rotational energy d by dt of half i omega squared. This leads to a period derivative of pulsar, which is proportional to b squared and inversely proportional to the period of pulsar. Therefore, initially the pulsar will spin down very rapidly, then its spin down rate will become smaller and smaller and smaller. And the spin down rate also is proportional to b squared. Therefore, a pulsar with a lower magnetic field will have a smaller spin down rate, and that rate will become smaller and smaller and smaller. And then you have a traffic jam, and that is how this island of pulsars is created, even though all pulsars are presumably born over here, where I am pointing with my cursor. Now I want to tell you about an extraordinary idea that was first suggested at the Raman Research Institute, where I used to work. This is the idea of reincarnation of pulsars. What do I mean by that? Pulsars switch off after many millions of years when their periods lengthen to a few seconds. Why do they switch off? There's the neutron stars are still spinning. They will still emit electromagnetic radiation of very low frequency, magnetic dipole radiation. A spinning magnet will radiate, but it will not radiate radio waves, let alone optical waves or X-rays or gamma rays. And the reason is the following. If you remember my earlier lecture on pulsars, in order to have radio radiation, the original gamma ray that is produced by a charge that has been pulled out of the surface and accelerated along an open field line, that gamma ray will have to produce electron-positron pairs. And these pairs will have to multiply till about 10 to the power 46 electron-positron pairs are produced. So unless you have this copious pair production, the rotating magnetized neutron star will not function as a radio emitting pulsar. So pulsars die. And this is the death line. I can assure you that this death line is not a line that I have plotted because there are no pulsars to the right. But this is actually a theoretically calculated line because the voltage generated by a rotating magnet 
is proportional to b squared divided by p. Therefore, the critical voltage will be will depend on both the magnetic field and the period, and in a log-log plot, that is a sloping line which is shown over there. So when these pulsars race from left to right, slow down and eventually cross the red line, they cease to function as the pulsar. Therefore, this, where I am pointing to, is the graveyard of pulsars. Let me repeat again, the neutron star is still spinning, with a period of several seconds and emitting very low frequency electromagnetic radiation, magnetic dipole radiation, but this radiation we cannot detect. It will be absorbed in the interstellar medium. Now the idea of reincarnation of the pulsar is the following. Let us consider the first born neutron star in a massive binary system. If you remember from the previous lecture, two neutron stars are born. Let us look, concentrate on the first neutron star. When it is born, it will be spinning very rapidly. It will have a strong magnetic field and therefore it will function as an ordinary pulsar, except that it will be in a binary system. And then it dies a natural death and it's sort of buried in the graveyard of pulsars. Now, when matter is transferred from the companion star to the first born neutron star during the second phase of mass transfer, if you remember from the previous lecture, then the neutron star will accrete angular momentum because the infalling matter brings with it angular momentum because we are dealing with matter from a binary companion. And this neutron star is now spun up to a very short period. So it crosses the death line for a second time, this time from the right to the left. First time it was from life to death, now it is from death to life. So it is in this sense that I talk about reincarnation of pulsars. A pulsar is born again. So the suggestion was made that the Hulstaler binary pulsar which is a combination of low magnetic field and short rotation period, must be a spun-up pulsar from a massive binary system. Now, to make a rapidly spinning pulsar, two things must happen. One, its magnetic field must decay because we find that the Hulstaler pulsar has a magnetic field which is only of the order of 10 to the power 10 Gauss. And secondly, the neutron star should be spun up to a very short period. In the case of the Hulstaler pulsar, it must be spun up from several second period of many, many seconds to a mere 59 millisecond to make it the second fastest pulsar. Now, how do we spin up a neutron star in a binary system? So let us quickly recall what I said in the previous lecture. These are the Roche equipotentials of a binary system consisting of two massive stars. What is shown as a dashed blue line is the Roche lobe of this binary system. The significance of this Roche lobe is that the Roche lobe of star A and star B touch one another at the first Lagrangian point L1. Therefore, when the companion star evolves and becomes a giant, it will fill its Roche lobe. It cannot become bigger than the Roche lobe. So like squeezing a toothpaste tube, the matter from the star will flow on to the companion star and there will be mass transfer. And if this is a neutron star, then the accreting matter will form an accretion disk. It will not fall radially into the star because it's coming in with a very large angular momentum. So it will form a disk like the rings of Saturn. And from there, it will presumably um, uh, the video froze for a few seconds. 
excuse me, and from from the accretion disk, it will pull on to the neutron star. Now, the radius of the Roche lobe will clearly depend upon the two masses and the separation. Smaller the mass of the star, smaller is the Roche lobe. Larger the mass of the star, larger is the Roche lobe. When a star evolves and becomes a giant, it will fill its Roche lobe and matter will be transferred to the companion. And if you remember this picture, we started out with a star whose masses were 25 solar mass and 10 solar mass. The 25 solar mass star evolved first, transferred all the mass to the 10 solar mass star. It became the less massive star, a luminous helium star of about 8 solar mass, which quickly evolved and exploded as a supernova, leaving behind a neutron star. And this explosion, as I argued last time, will not disrupt the binary system. Now, when the second star, which has now grown in mass because of mass transfer from the companion, evolves and becomes a giant, it will fill its Roche lobe and transfer mass to the neutron star. Much of the mass will be expelled from the system because the neutron star cannot accept mass at a rate greater than a critical rate, and we shall come to that presently. And eventually, this will explode as a supernova, producing the second neutron star in the system. And in the majority of cases, the two neutron stars will be unbound, move in opposite directions. But in rare cases, like in the case of the Hull-Steyler binary pulsar, it will be a bound system with a highly eccentric orbit. Now, <clears throat> so that is the idea that the Hull-Steyler pulsar must have been spun up from its graveyard to short period because its magnetic field had decayed from its initial large value. Now the question is, what will be the period of the neutron star after this spin-up is over? Will it be anything like the period of the Hulse-Taylor binary pulsar? Now, here is the important concept that I want to introduce, and I would like you to listen to this very carefully. A magnetized neutron star accreting from an accretion disk, which is in the equatorial plane, will attain an equilibrium period. Why will it attain an equilibrium period? We'll come to that presently. Now, let us look at the accretion disk. Let us look at this in the equatorial plane. Here is the neutron star, and this is its magnetic field. This is the accretion disk. If there was no magnetic field, the accretion disk will touch the surface of the star. But in this case, the accretion disk will not touch the surface of the star. Why won't it do that? Because the matter in the accretion disk is ionized. And a magnetic field has a pressure, b squared over 8 pi per unit volume. And therefore, at a distance which is determined by the strength of the magnetic field, the magnetic pressure b squared over 8 pi will become greater than the ramp pressure of the infalling matter, and the magnetic field will say, stop, no further. Stop right there. And that radius at which the strength of the mag magnetic pressure balances the ramp pressure is known as the alpha n radius, a Swedish physicist who discussed the notion of uh, magnetic fields in stars uh, much earlier and for which he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics. Now, it's a straightforward matter to calculate this alpha n radius by equating the magnetic pressure b squared over 8 pi to the ramp pressure rho v squared. And when you do that, and I shall not uh, take time to do this algebra, you get an expression for the alpha n radius, which is proportional to b to the power 4 by 7, divided by the accretion rate m dot, whole squared in the denominator. Now, don't worry about the details of this formula. I only want you to know that the magnetic field will come in. It will be in the numerator. 
the rate of accretion will come in and it will be in the denominator. Why? If the magnetic field is stronger, then b squared over 8 pi will be larger and the infalling matter from the accretion disk will be stopped at a larger radius. Therefore, the alpha n radius will be larger. If it is raining heavily on the neutron star, if the accretion rate is very large, then the magnetic field will be squeezed more and therefore the alpha n radius will be smaller. Therefore, the magnetic field makes the alpha n radius larger and the accretion rate, which is the rate at which matter is raining on the neutron star, will come in the denominator. All right? Now, now, let us look at this from the pole. There is the neutron star spinning at its own period. And there is the accretion disk in green. And you notice that the accretion disk doesn't quite touch the surface of the neutron star. And that's because this dot dot uh, dotted region is the magnetic field. And that is where the magnetic field, the pressure of the magnetic field balances the ramp pressure of matter. Now, I'm going to tell you something rather interesting. The neutron star will now adjust its period of rotation till its period of rotation becomes equal to the Keplerian period at which the matter at the inner edge of the accretion disk is rotating. Now, why would it do that? Why would it do that? Well, for a very simple reason. Accept that for a moment. If it adjusts its period, that period is known as the equilibrium period. And that equilibrium period will depend upon the strength of the magnetic field and inversely at, as the accretion rate. We'll come back to this formula in a minute, but please let me go on and explain why the neutron star will adjust its spin rate. Now, look at this picture over here. Here is the accretion disk formed by the matter coming from the companion star. And here is the neutron star with the magnetic axis slightly inclined to the rotation axis. The magnetic pressure has stopped the accretion disk at that distance, so that distance is the alpha n radius. Now, matter cannot cross the magnetic field lines because the magnetic pressure exceeds the, uh, the kinetic energy per unit volume of the infalling matter, but the particles can flow along the magnetic field because the Lorentz force is zero, V cross B is zero if V is parallel to B. So I already discussed this in the previous lecture. This leads to the X-ray emission. So the accreting matter will flow along the magnetic field line, North Pole and South Pole. But when this matter accretes onto the neutron star, it not only deposits energy, which is released in the form of X-rays, but it also deposits, it deposits angular momentum. The angular momentum is coming from the binary matter, coming from the binary companion. And therefore, it will spin it up. Now you'll say, wait a minute, what is the guarantee that the neutron star was originally spinning in the same direction as the infalling matter? Maybe the neutron star is spinning in the opposite direction. I don't care. I don't care for a simple reason that the angular momentum of the matter coming in from the companion is enormous compared to the angular momentum I omega of the neutron star because of the very large lever arm. Remember, angular momentum is mvr or it is m omega r squared. So it is proportional to r squared, where r is the length of the lever arm, which is the distance between the neutron star and the companion star, which is enormous compared to the stellar radius of a mere 10 kilometers. Therefore, the neutron star, even if it was spinning in the opposite direction, will be made to spin in the same direction, and the neutron star will spin up. So what I'm saying is that the accreting matter exerts a torque, an electromagnetic torque on the neutron star. And the angular momentum that the neutron star accretes will make it spin up till the period of rotation of the neutron star 
becomes precisely equal to the period of rotation of the Keplerian period of the matter in the inner edge of the accretion disk. So that is the concept of the equilibrium period. It's a very simple concept and it's a very beautiful concept. You think about it, play back this video and listen to it again. So a neutron star, so let's go back to this picture. A neutron star, which was spinning at its own rate, will now spin up till its period of rotation becomes equal to the Keplerian period at the inner edge of the accretion disk. And what is the communication between the accretion disk and the neutron star? It is the electromagnetic torque exerted on the spinning neutron star by the infalling matter. So that's the concept of the equilibrium period. So to summarize again, a magnetized neutron star accreting from an accretion disk will adjust its period of rotation to an equilibrium period which is equal to the Keplerian period at the inner edge of the accretion disk. And that equilibrium period is simply obtained by putting in the Keplerian period at the inner edge of the accretion disk. Keplerian period is determined by the distance from the center of mass. And that distance, of course, is just the alpha and radius, which you get by equating the magnetic pressure B squared over 8 pi with the ramp pressure rho B squared. So the equilibrium period is proportional to B to the power 6 over 7 and inversely proportional to m dot dm by dt, the rate at which matter is accreting onto the neutron star to the power 3 by 7, which comes in the denominator. So the idea that was advanced in 1978 is that the Hull-Steyler binary pulsar must be a recycle pulsar. It was resurrected from its graveyard by accreting angular momentum from the companion star, and it was spun up to an equilibrium period line, and that equilibrium period is determined by its magnetic field. And so the idea was that the binary pulsar must be somewhere located close to this green line. But where is this green line? Because the green line, if I plot the logarithm of the equilibrium period as a function of the logarithm of the magnetic field, then it will be log p will be proportional to log b. All right, so it will be a straight line with a slope approximately equal to 1 in a log-log plot. So the, this is the equilibrium period line. But please remember that the equilibrium period is determined not only by the strength of the magnetic field, but also by the accretion rate m dot. Now the m dot can be anything. It can be small or large. Therefore, the green line could be there or there or there. It could be anywhere in this plane. So how are you going to fix that? So unless I also can make a statement about the accretion rate, what it can be, what it cannot be, I cannot tell you how fast I can spin up a neutron star by accreting from a companion. So let's go back to this picture once again. So the equilibrium period is determined both by the magnetic field and also by the accretion rate and the accretion rate comes to the denominator. Therefore, if I plot logarithm of the magnetic field and the logarithm of the rotation period, this equilibrium period line in the log plot will be a sloping straight line, and that is the blue line over there. So a neutron star will be spun up to shorter and shorter period if the accretion rate is larger and larger and larger, because accretion rate is coming in the denominator, if I increase m dot, the equilibrium period will decrease. And let us say this is the value of the accretion rate, then the neutron star will be spun up to that period. But now suppose I increase the accretion rate from the companion. After all, the neutron star has no control over the accretion rate. It's coming from the companion. 
it depends on how much I squeeze the toothpaste tube, how much matter is being transferred from the companion star. So let me increase m dot. Then the equilibrium period for any value of the magnetic field will become shorter. If I let me increase the accretion rate even more, then the equilibrium period will be even shorter for all values of the magnetic field. And for that particular value of the magnetic field, that will be the equilibrium period. Therefore, the equilibrium period could be either this or this or this, depending upon whether the accretion rate is this or this or this. So can we make any definite statement? So we can ask the following question. So let me repeat. Smaller the magnetic field, so previously I said, greater the accretion rate, shorter the equilibrium period. So that's what is plotted here. Greater the accretion rate, shorter is the rotation period. Now I'm saying, smaller the magnetic field, shorter the equilibrium period, because the magnetic field comes in the numerator. So if the magnetic field for a given accretion rate, if that is the magnetic field, the neutron star will be spun up to that period. But if the magnetic field of the neutron star was smaller, then it will be spun up to that period. But in the case of the Hull's Taylor pulsar, we know what its magnetic field is. So what we have to settle now is the accretion rate. Therefore, I'm going to ask a nasty question. For a given magnetic field of 3 times 10 to the power 10 Gauss, which is the observed magnetic field of the hulls taylor binary pulsar, can we spin up the neutron star to arbitrarily small period by going on increasing the accretion rate? Because after all, there is 26 or 28 solar mass of matter which is falling in. So in principle, I can go on accreting at any rate that I want. And therefore, I can spin up the neutron star to arbitrarily short period. Can I do that? The answer is no. You cannot do that. And the reason for that is related to the Eddington luminosity limit of the stars, which we discussed in the third lecture. Why are the stars as they are? Now, I don't want to take time to repeat the arguments all the time. So as I said in, at that time, in Eddington's theory, stars have to be in radiative equilibrium. What that means is that, uh, let's consider a, a unit volume, which I'm pointing to over there, inside the star, let's say the surface of the star or anywhere interior to the star. Gravity is pulling it inwards due to the mass interior to that unit volume. Radiation pressure is pushing that unit volume outwards. Why is the radiation pressure pushing, pushing it? Because radiation is pushing the electron, where it's also pushing the protons, but because the ma mass of the proton is 2,000 times larger, what really matters is the radiation pressure on the electrons. So that's what is uh, written here in this formula. The radiant flux uh, uh, F is equal to the luminosity generated at the center divided by 4 pi r squared c multiplied by the number of electrons n in the unit volume multiplied by the cross section subtended by each electron to Thomson scattering, which is sigma Thomson scattering. And if you remember, go back and revise that lecture, the Thomson scattering cross section is 8 pi by 3 multiplied by the square of the classical radius of the electron. The classical radius of the electron is calculated from the formula E squared over RC, the electrostatic energy, is equal to the rest mass energy of the electron. Now, if you equate that radiant force to the gravitational force on the unit mass due to the mass interior, which is G m of R multiplied by the mass of that unit volume divided by R square, then I get the Eddington luminosity limit. The Eddington luminosity limit is the maximum luminosity a star can have and if, if its luminosity were to exceed that value, then the star will be blown apart by radiation pressure. And that Eddington luminosity limit is solely determined by the mass of the star apart from fundamental constants. And its value is 
10 to the power 38 per second times mass divided by the mass of the sun. So now, that is just a recap of what we discussed in the third lecture. Now let's get back to matter raining on the neutron star. When a matter of mass small m falls on the neutron star, as we discussed in the earlier lecture, the gravitational potential energy release is of the order of 10% of the rest mass energy. And that rest mass, 10% of the rest mass energy is radiated essentially as X-rays, as we discussed in the previous lecture. Now, the luminosity generated by these X-rays is, will be proportional to m dot c squared multiplied by some efficiency factor. Why is it m dot c squared and not mc squared? mc squared would be the energy radiated, but matter is falling at the rate m dot, therefore the rate of energy radiated dE by dt, which is the luminosity, will be proportional to m dot accretion rate. Now, imagine the following. It's raining heavily and you have an umbrella which you have opened up. Drops of rain fall on the umbre umbrella and it produces a lot of noise. It produces sound waves, if you can visualize this. Imagine that it's raining so heavily that the sound waves you produce by the raindrops hitting the umbrella, if the sound waves are so strong that it blows away the incoming raindrops. Just imagine that scenario. You understand, right? The sound waves generated by the raindrops hitting the surface of the umbrella is so strong that the pressure of the sound waves just blows away the raindrops from falling. That means that you cannot accrete raindrops faster than a certain critical rate on the umbrella because if you did, the sound waves which you inevitably generate when the raindrops hit the umbrella will push the raindrops back again. So now if you remember from the previous lecture, matter which falls on to the neutron star hits the surface, heat, heats up a football size area of the surface and from that hot patch x-rays are coming out. And the x-rays will exert radiation pressure on, on the incoming electrons and protons. Now, if the luminosity of the x-rays that you generate exceeds a certain critical value, then the radiation pressure exerted on the infalling matter by the x-rays that you have produced will prevent further increase in the accretion rate. Therefore, what I'm saying is that Corresponding to the Eddington luminosity limit, there is an Eddington accretion rate. Because if you increase the accretion rate to beyond this value, then the luminosity of X-rays that you generate as a consequence of accretion will be so enormous that it will simply prevent matter from falling onto the surface of the neutron star. And that Eddington rate, if I use this formula, Eddington rate of accretion, if I remember, use this formula for the Eddington luminosity, is m dot Eddington is 10 to the 17 grams per second, roughly one Mount Everest per second. So what I'm saying is that even though the companion star is willing to give you 26 or 27 solar masses of matter, the neutron star cannot accept all this matter. It will not allow more than one Everest worth of mass falling onto it every second, 10 to the power 17 grams per second. Because if it did, then the luminosity, the X-rays generated as a consequence of the accretion will prevent matter from coming in. In other words, what I'm saying is that corresponding to the Eddington luminosity limit, there is a maximum value for the rate of accretion onto the neutron star, which means that 
since the equilibrium period depends both on the magnetic field and on the accretion rate now i am saying that you for a given magnetic field you cannot go on decreasing the equilibrium period to shorter and shorter and shorter value by going on increasing the accretion rate to larger and larger and larger value because you cannot increase the accretion rate beyond the eddington limit and if i put in this eddington limit of 7 10 to the power 17 grams per second into the formula and put in all the dot dot dots which i have not bothered to show then i get a minimum value for the equilibrium period to which a neutron star will be spun up and that minimum period is 1.9 milliseconds multiplied by magnetic field to the power 6 over 7 in units of 10 to the power 9 gauss in other words if the magnetic field of the neutron star is 10 to the power 9 gauss then the minimum equilibrium period will be 1.9 millisecond now so here it is the minimum equilibrium period of a neutron star will correspond to the accretion at the maximum rate of m dot eddington and that is given by this formula so i hope you understand now that this re the pulsar which has been born again will be spun up to a, to its minimum equilibrium period which is now uniquely determined by the magnetic field strength therefore i can now plot this equilibrium period line green line uniquely because i can now fix the value of m dot which will tell you whether it should be over there or there or there in the diagram now you notice that the the halstellar binary pulsar is very close to this critical equilibrium period line now i want you to appreciate that this critical equilibrium period line drawn in magenta has absolutely no adjustable parameter because apart from fundamental constant the only parameter that came into it was the accretion rate now i put the value for the accretion rate equal to the maximum possible value it can have which is the eddington accretion rate of 10 to the 17 grams per second and this proximity of this halstellar pulsar to the limiting equilibrium period line confirms that the halstellar pulsar must indeed be a recycle pulsar a pulsar which has undergone reincarnation it's a born again pulsar and it has been spun up by creating matter and angular momentum from the companion and this was pointed out way back in 78 and 1980 some predictions are made along with this theory the the first statement is the halstellar pulsar is a recycle pulsar from a massive binary the notion of recycle pulsar was introduced for the very first time in the astronomical literature it was also stated that this is the first born neutron star whose field has decayed and which has been spun up remember the other star is also a neutron star so what we are saying is that the neutron star that you see is the first born neutron star because it's only the first born neutron star which will undergo recycling so this was the first identification of any pulsar as a recycle pulsar and a clear prediction was made about the second neutron star that we do not see So how can you make? How can you ever confirm this prediction because you don't see the second neutron star? The first, the prediction is the second born neutron star will be an ordinary pulsar. Its field will be of the order of ten to the power twelve gauss, and its period will be of the order of second. It will be indistinguishable from any old garden variety pulsar. So this was the prediction made in nineteen hundred and eighty. So. the prediction is that the halstellar binary pulsar that we see is a recycle pulsar it is the first born neutron star in the binary system its field is low because over time the magnetic field has decayed and its period is short because it has been spun up to its minimum equilibrium period by the companion star 
and the prediction is that the second born pulsar which if you could see by going to some other part of the galaxy you will find that it is an unprocessed ordinary pulsar its magnetic field will be high canonical value of 10 to the power 12 or 10 to the power 13 gauss and its rotation period will not be milliseconds but will be of the order of a second or so almost 20 years later in fact exactly 20 years later a double pulsar was found a binary pulsar with an incredibly short orbital period of just 2.45 hours which we mentioned in the previous lecture where both the neutron stars are beaming towards us one of them is the recycle first born pulsar because its period of rotation is very short only 22 milliseconds and its magnetic field is only 6 times 10 to the power 9 gauss so it's a recycle pulsar the second neutron star which we do see in this case its period of rotation is almost 3 seconds and its magnetic field is 10 to the power 12 gauss so it is an unprocessed ordinary garden variety neutron star so the prediction made in 1980 was confirmed by direct observation in 2000 now for recycle pulsars uh, uh, two things must happen one is the neutron star has to be spun up and secondly the magnetic field must decay now the story of the magnetic field decay is a rather subtle one and i don't have much time to explain that but let me quickly uh, tell you those of you who are interested can go and refer to other talks i have given to which i shall refer to where you can find details of how the magnetic field decays so let me quickly tell you how the magnetic field decays first i must tell you that magnetic fields of stars cannot decay very easily because magnetic fields are produced by current loops current magnetic fields can only decay if the current loop decays due to ohmic dissipation and ohm's law enables you to calculate what will be the typical time over which the magnetic field will decay which is the time scale over which the currents will decay now if you do this calculation for any star let alone a star with a density of 10 to the power 14 grams per cubic centimeter you will find the ohmic dissipation time scale is of the order of 10 to the power 23 years the age of the universe is only 10 to the power 10 years therefore due to ohmic decay the magnetic field can never decay now some 30 years ago 32 years ago i came up with a crazy idea of using the feynman vortices if you remember we discussed that when we made a journey to the center of the neutron star to the rescue now if you remember from that lecture this is the core of the neutron star the core of the neutron star consists of neutrons and protons 95% neutrons 5% protons the neutrons are in a rotating bucket and the protons are superconducting now if you remember i said even there is a magnetic field in the superconductor the magnetic field can only penetrate through quantized vortices these are the quantized vortices similarly the neutron star the neutrons are a superfluid a superfluid in a rotating bucket will generate lot of quantized vortices and these vortices will be parallel to the rotation axis so these are the feynman vortices these are the abrikoso vortices in the neutron star so inside the neutron star core there are two brands of spaghetti there are the rotational vortices spaghetti ala feynman and there are the abrikoso quantized spaghetti parallel to the magnetic axis so it is like the strings of a tennis racket the two brands of spaghetti are stuck to one another now there are 10 to the power 16 feynman vortices in a neutron superfluid if the bucket is spinning with a period of 1 second and there are 10 to the power 31 quantized flux tubes in a neutron star whose magnetic field is of the order of 10 to the power 12 gauss now here is the punchline 
the number of Feynman vortices in a rotating bucket of superfluid will be proportional to the angular velocity of rotation. So the superfluid will create as many vortices as required, each with a quantum of circulation, h divided by 2m. Therefore, the total circulation of all these vortices will be equal to the circulation of the bucket. Therefore, here is the idea. As the neutron star slows down, the number of Feynman vortices will decrease and the Feynman spaghettis will move out from the interior. How do we know that? Because this droplet, if I slow it down, the number of vortices does slow down. We know this experimentally. Now, these Feynman vortices are entangled with the other brand of spaghettis. Therefore, as the neutron star slows down, the magnetic spaghettis are dragged by the Feynman spaghettis and the magnetic field is deposited in the crust of the neutron star, the red region, where it can decay due to ohmic dissipation. There is no superconductivity there. There is no superfluidity there over millions of years. And we have lots of times. So this is the basic idea. I do not expect you to have understood what I said, but if you would like to know more about it, I shall give you reference. You go to the website, you'll find the references, and you can read about it some more. So the basic idea, according to this theory, is that when a pulsar is recycled and resurrected from the graveyard, the period to which it will be spun up will depend upon how much its magnetic field has decayed. So that is the idea. If the magnetic field has only decayed that much, it will be spun up to that period. If the magnetic field has decayed to that much, it will be spun up to that period. Now, an important prediction that was made in 1982 by us at the Raman Institute, that there will be two distinct populations of recycled pulsars. There will be a population of first-born neutron stars from massive binaries, like the Hull-Staler binary pulsar. Their residual fields will be of the order of 10 to the power 10 Gauss, according to this theory of flux expulsion from a superconductor. The second population are first-born neutron stars with low mass companions, companion of the neutron star whose masses are solar mass or even less their magnetic fields will decay to 5 times 10 to the power 8 Gauss. So this is the prediction that was made in 1978 and 1982. So there will be two populations of recycled pulsars, one from massive binaries. They will have a magnetic field of the order of 10 to the power 10 Gauss. The second will be a population of recycled pulsars from low mass binaries their magnetic field will be of the order of 5 times 10 to the power 8 Gauss. And both these populations will be sitting on the critical equilibrium period line. And so 40 years later, this is what the data shows us. This is the plot of the logarithm of the magnetic field on the y-axis as a function of the logarithm of the period on the x-axis. Inside this Theon circle, there are 2,300 pulsars. All of them are solitary pulsars, like the crab pulsar, single pulsar, no binary companions. These are all binary pulsars, pulsars with binary companions. Here are pulsars whose magnetic field is of the order of 10 to the power 10 Gauss. This, these are recycled pulsars and this form the population one because all these pulsars have companions which are massive. So these are the massive pulsars from massive binary. Then there are about a hundred pulsars whose magnetic field is of the order of 5 times 10 to the power 8 Gauss, exactly as it was predicted in 1982. This is the population, also a population of recycled pulsars. These are the millisecond pulsars with low mass white dwarf companions. 
and that is the spin up line corresponding to the eddington accretion rate so you see that the predictions made in 1982 40 years ago have been spectacularly confirmed in the next lecture we shall move away from neutron stars we shall discuss millisecond pulsars in a separate lecture later on in the next lecture we shall move on to far away radio galaxies there are thousands and thousands of radio galaxies such as shown in this picture till then thank you very much for your attention